Good morning, MDUMC, and happy Mother's Day to you all. I am Michael Jarbo, and I'm just so thankful that we can join together online this morning. Whether this is your very first time worshiping with us, we want to say welcome, or if you've been with us every single week, we are glad that you are here this morning. Thank you for being here. Although we can't worship together, we are finding ways to learn, live, give, and serve all together. There are opportunities to join together for study, for daily reflections, Alpha, and more classes are online each week. We invite you to take part in it via mdumc.org slash stream. Connecting with other people and living in community is at the core of what it means to follow Jesus. Since we are currently unable to host groups and classes in person, we have decided to try something a little bit new. It's called MDUMC Triads. Now a triad is a group of three or four people in the same stage of life who are committed to practicing prayer and spiritual direction. You'll meet weekly or bi-weekly in whatever format works best for your group. You can learn more and sign up at mdumc.org slash triads. Or you can contact Colin Bagby himself at colinbagby at mdumc.org. Another way you can connect this week is by joining us for The Gathering. It's online this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. You'll hear from Dr. Brad Morgan and other leaders as we discuss plans for reopening MDMC and the next steps for our congregation. You should have received a survey in your email about our reopening plans. We're asking you to please complete that survey by this Tuesday to let us know how you feel about returning to in-person opportunities at church. Find everything you need to participate at mdumc.org slash stream. Even while distanced, we are finding ways to safely feed and assist our wider community in Houston. For details on how you can donate supplies or serve right now, visit mdumc.org slash missions. Your generous giving is still incredibly important to all of us here at MDUMC. All the ministries that enable us to be better serving God and our neighbor here and around the world are made possible by your dedicated giving. We invite you to make a contribution online at mdumc.org slash give. And if you need any assistance, we are here to help. Contact Nina Davis at mdumc.org for more information. Today, we are wrapping up our Supporting Actors series by a great sermon by Pastor Colin Bagby, and we're looking forward to what's coming up next in worship. Next week, we are starting a new series here at MDUMC called Separated, Letters to a Distant Church where we will be talking about how we can live as a unified body through the Spirit, even though we are physically distant. You can help with a special project by capturing some video of you or your family as you take part in worship this morning from home. Just take out your phone right now and take a quick video. It can be of yourself, your breakfast setup during worship, uh, someone dancing to the great music that you're hearing, just be yourself, be natural, and make sure to turn your phone sideways so the video is horizontal. You can email that video to us at communications at mdumc.org, and you're done. Thank you so much for helping to make this upcoming series come to life and keep our congregation connected. We can't wait to see how you're worshiping at home. As always, we are thankful for your continued commitment to the mission and ministry of MDUMC. Worship will be starting in just a moment. Thanks again for joining us here today. We are glad that you are here.
Now let us join together in our call to worship. God alone is our refuge and hope, our shelter and protection. From our very first breath to our last, God's love and compassion never fails. So come, lift your voices in praise to God who gathers us and teaches us the ways we should go. Bear witness to God's acts of mercy and hope. Proclaim God's glory to all who will hear. Okay. I'm kind of tired of all this, all this waiting and, you know, and just not our everyday life. And I miss my friends and I miss my family and I want to hug them. I want to high five them. I want to look them in the eye really close. And it's just, it's getting hard. Yeah, it is kind of hard being in this place. Like, I mean, we just kind of are together and we can't go out and see mm -hmm. anyone else. I'm, yeah. I, I'm feeling impatient. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see where you're going with that. I, I can get some of those feelings too. And that kind of reminds me of the, the scripture I was reading just this morning. And so the scripture in it, Jesus is talking to the disciples and in it, Jesus tells them that they have to wait. Mm, I remember that one. And waiting is kind of like needing to be patient. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, uh, waiting. Does anybody like waiting? It's hard. No, it's so hard. And especially now, I was like, we just want to go out and do things, mm -hmm. right? And so I was thinking, you you know sign language, right? Little tiny bit. Just a little bit, right? Uh-huh. And so, so sometimes, whenever we're in this place where we're waiting and we're impatient, maybe something we could do is learn the sign language for patience and that can help calm us down. That's a good idea. What do you think? Do you know Do you I, know the sign language? I do. It's really simple. Okay. So you just take your thumb like this. Okay. Yeah. And you put it right here on your chin. Uh-huh. And you go down. And you go down. And that's patience. That is patience. Patience. So as we get into this time of waiting and this time of trying to be patient or yeah. to be more patient, just like Jesus has encouraged us to do, uh -huh. and also a time of waiting. 
that he just gave to the disciples and said, wait for the right time. I guess that's a message I need to learn. That sure is. Yeah. Will you say a prayer for us today, Miss Lauren? Let's do that. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for bringing us here today. Help us have patience. Help us have patience. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Let us take a moment of silence and reflection before we pray. Our gracious God, we claim you as our provider and sustainer of all that we have. We trust that you are watching over our lives and we are grateful for your holy presence. We recognize that our selfish ways hinder our connection to those things that truly matter. May this whole time that we have been in our homes, we have learned an authentic way of life and that the things that are not seen are now our priority. We ask you to help us see the need for others and for us to spread your love to those that are looking for hope. We wanna be faithful followers. We pray for those who are in sorrow. We pray for those who need healing we pray for those who need strength. We pray for those who need redemption and forgiveness. We pray for unity in our families, in our communities, in our nation and in our world now more than ever before. Ignite in us a fervent desire to seek you daily. We ask all this in the knowledge that we are weak and incapable of doing this alone until we surrender to your Holy Spirit but with relief and gratitude, 
we hear how that is done in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, we are grateful for your generous giving and your prayers during this unusual time. Through your gifts, we have been able to serve many that have been in need. We want to encourage you to continue with your offerings and to continue to pray as we begin to move forward. I want to remind you that your gifts and offerings are a gesture of our good stewardship in building God's kingdom here on earth.
morning, MDUMC. Thanks for being with us in worship today as we continue in our series, Supporting Actors, New Testament Edition, as we look at a somewhat of a character in the New Testament, Theophilus. We don't know a lot about him, but he's important to the story of the gospel as it spreads throughout the world. So hear this from the first chapter of Luke and from the first chapter of Acts. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 say this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And then at the beginning of the first chapter of Acts, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, and after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, through these words of Luke and Acts, bring us to an encounter with your word in the person of Jesus Christ. Transform us in your image, shape us in your likeness, compel us to do your work in the world, to spread good news. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1960, famed author, philosopher, Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis unexpectedly lost his wife, Joy, to cancer. And in his grief, in his reflection, in his unpacking his experience, he wrote a short book called A Grief Observed. And now we know it to be written by C.S. Lewis and is a popular book to be shared with those going through grief and loss. It was published in 1961, but in 1961 it wasn't published under the name C.S. Lewis, but was published under a pseudonym, N.W. Clerk. To protect his privacy and the sensitivity of the situation he was in, C.S. Lewis wrote under this pseudonym so he could share this reflection on grief without the attention, without being annoyed by people that wanted to talk to him and learn more from him, just to share this with the world. In, in his grief, he wrote this amazing book, and it was shared with others, and Francis Warner, a professor at Oxford, a professor of mine, share, shares this story that he, he knew of a person that that had the book, that was moved by it, and didn't know it was by C.S. Lewis, but knew that C.S. Lewis was going through a hard time, was experiencing grief and loss and the loss of his wife, Joy. And so he gave the book as a gift and an encouragement to C.S. Lewis, not knowing that he was the one who had written it. It's a testament, of course, to C.S. Lewis's own writing, how moving and helpful this person thought it would be to give to his grieving friend, to give to his friend that had lost his wife but also a testament not just to the writer, but to the attentive friend. Because we do this 
If we're sensitive, if we're attentive, if we're kind and compassionate and loving towards someone, we know in what situation and what time in their life they need good news, they need support, they need guidance. And we might stumble across an article or a piece of scripture or a song or a movie or something else to pass along to someone who needs support, who needs to be loved and cared for in that way. Where people are and what they've experienced More sensitive and attentive people share good news to them. They notice their situation. They contextualize it. They they share something with them. For instance, you might notice in context that uh, my hair is a little out of control. And so you might offer the good news that shortly uh, barber shops and salons will be open. Not only that, but you can readily buy clippers at the store and my wife could give me a haircut if I were so brave. Sometimes we also notice advice might be cultural or guidance and and care might be cultural. It's unique to the West that someone might have a fear of the number 13 because of superstition. Triskaidekaphobia is what it's called. Try to say that five times fast. But triskaidekaphobia doesn't exist in the East like a country like Japan or China. In Japan, it's tetraphobia, fear of the number four. And so if someone had one of these conditions, triskaidekaphobia or tetraphobia, you would give them specific guidance. You would give them specific counseling to overcome it, knowing that it's purely cultural. In love and care and attention to another, we share news that helps comfort and guide a person in pain, in grief, in need for something. Frankly, that's how we got the books of Luke and Acts. If you didn't know, when we find manuscripts of Luke and Acts, more often than not, they're one volume, one work, one piece of writing written by one single author, Luke, this first century biography of the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and Acts, a follow-up, a sequel, if you will, to this story written about those who followed Jesus after his ascension, the story of the early church. Tradition would have it that this book was written by a person named Luke, a companion of Paul, one of the apostles, a physician, a healer, someone who cared for others. And we hear at the beginning of Luke his reasoning for sharing this with this person named Theophilus, a person about which we know very little. We know at least in some way he was associated with or had some connection to the early Christian community. We know the author of Luke and Acts was a physician and companion of Paul and so was in charge of, in some way, sharing good news as Paul did. We know, for some reason, Luke calls Theophilus in verse 3 of chapter 1 of Luke, most excellent. Sounds like something written by Bill and Ted of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but most excellent, this title is only used in the New Testament by the author Luke, in Luke and in Acts and only used to talk about political officials and people in power. So we might infer, we might understand that Theophilus was a person in power, a Roman official, a political figure. To add to that argument, Luke often uses political figures in both Luke and Acts to show, to contextualize where this story of Jesus and his people was happening. We argue that this might be the recipient Uh, This recipient might be a Roman official, might be someone in power. And Theophilus, knowing or maybe being familiar with these political figures, would be appreciative of knowing when this happened in history. Some also argue that Theophilus, much like C.S. Lewis's pseudonym N.W. Clerk, was a pseudonym itself. Maybe he had to protect his identity for fear of being persecuted as a Christian, Others argue that Theophilus is a stand-in for any person because Theophilus literally means beloved by God, friend of God, loved by God, that it's general, it's a, a general writing and not for a specific person. We also know, however, that in the argument of a, an individual that this person is looking for certainty, as verse 4 of first chapter of Luke says, so that you may know the certainty, some translations say with certainty, the things you have been taught. Theophilus has inherited or or heard or received this good news about Jesus, and Luke's account, as detailed and thorough as it is in Luke and Acts, is to give good news to someone who's longing for some certainty. And finally, uh, another point. Theophilus may, in fact, live in Jerusalem. The scale of the book of Luke and Acts 
begins in Jerusalem and the charge given in Acts is to share this good news from Jerusalem to the world and whoever received this, potentially this person, this Roman official named Theophilus, was given the charge to take it from Jerusalem to the world. However you read it, whatever argument you agree with or, or, or find to be true, Theophilus is someone Luke believes, whether a real person, a stand-in, one of us, a person on the brink. Luke wants to tell this person, whoever he or she is, that they are loved by God, not just in name only, but actually really loved by God. You, a potentially a Roman official or power broker, are part of God's grander story in Jesus Christ. You are enlivened by and empowered by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and is seeking to give you new life. This good news is for you. This good news you can be certain of. We follow the story given to Theophilus and we follow it to its conclusion in the book of Acts and follow up with it in the letters written by Paul. We find this continuity, something that we ourselves can step into. Good news inherited by Luke from the other gospel writers and tellers of this gospel story to Theophilus, this person beloved by God, to us and to the world. There's continuity in this story, we find. Passed from the earliest apostles' records to Luke's new account that has so much detail and so much compelling information, to Theophilus, to the early church, to the West in Jerusalem, to the Americas, to us now, today. We are this story's next recipients. We are, in many ways, Theophilus. We are given this timeline, we are given this charge to be its next communicators. Theophilus, whoever he or she or they were, however they did it, they passed it along, just as the women at the tomb passed the good news along. So this is our charge, this is our command, this is what we are searching for, most excellent MDUMC. Here's the good news that many in our world are thirsting for. This, that Luke tells us in Luke and Acts, that God has come to be with us. God has come to be with us in the person of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, has given us a body of believers in the church, is not just for a select few people, but for everyone, exclusively inclusive good news. It's good news for the world, all the world, every person in every place, poor, powerful, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. This is your story, Theophilus. This is your story, MDUMC. This is your story, beloved by God. Many have given an account of it to mark their time, to make sense of their world, and now that task is given to us. To share Luke's story, to share Theophilus' story, to share our story connected to Jesus' story in our own time. This is our opportunity to share it. And how will we do it in a troubling time, in a time of suffering, in a, in a time when we are attentive and know that people are longing for good news, longing for confirmation, longing for that certainty that Theophilus longed for? How will we continue this tradition of sharing the story? How are we attentive and sensitive enough to share it helpfully and winsomely and carefully and compassionately? Because where, where Lewis was, where Theophilus was, where we are, the world is. Beloved of God, that's simply our charge, to give good news, to take this account in Luke, in Acts, of the story of Jesus and the early church, most excellent MDUMC, to give God's work to the world, to give what Luke shared with Theophilus, to remember that it's happening even now, and you're a part of it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Beloved, as we respond to God's word, let us join together in prayer. I invite you to listen to each petition and to add your own prayers in your heart during a moment of silence. Let us pray. God of love, you invite each of us to take part in your story of salvation for all the world. 
We give you thanks today for those who help us find and create places to belong in our own lives and in your world. For those who inspire us through the example of their lives and faith. For those who help us in discerning our own gifts and vocations. for all who nurture, provide for the well-being and growth of others. For family and friends who help us know what home means. for those who have extended a hand when we felt most alone. Oh God, make us faithful voices in your unfolding story that all the world may hear your constant invitation to abundant life. All this we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. And now as bearers of God's word, let us join together in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us in worship today as we continue in our series supporting actors new testament edition it's been a joy to be with you in worship and we hope you will come back next week now receive this benediction in the likeness of the father create something beautiful in the likeness of the son share love and compassion with everyone in the likeness of the spirit energize and empower those around you to do god's work in the world Go in peace, friends. Amen.